yet. If you think there's nothing you can do when disaster strikes, think again. In just four days, I'll build a toolkit for survival. My end game to be ready for anything. I'm Tim Ferriss. Everything is going up. Best selling author and human guinea pig. I'll show you how to make the impossible possible by bending the rules. Pull yourself together. I'll find the world's best teachers and push myself to the edge to deconstruct, decode, and demystify some of the world's toughest challenges in record time. When can we be stronger? If I can do it, so can you. This week's experiment is urban escape. Why urban escape? Well, think about some of my experiments. Three gun shooting, Brazilian jiu jitsu, parkour, language learning, high stakes poker, rally car racing. The only thing missing for me to become James Bond, which has been the point, the secret agenda all along, is learning how to disappear. But it's not all about being a secret agent. There are a lot of good reasons to learn practical skills for survival and self-reliance. Debate what you may, but it's really established fact, as far as I'm concerned. When you look at hundreds of historical examples, like Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, whatever it might be, that desperate times call for desperate measures. According to new research, the frequency of superstorms and natural disasters is on the rise. Crime is another reason to hone your self-awareness and self-defense. You may want to stop for this. Especially if you spend a lot of time in large cities or traveling overseas. Preparing for the worst that could happen isn't paranoia, it's practical. It's cheap insurance against worst case scenarios. Tim. Hey. I'm Kevin. Kevin, nice to finally meet you. Kevin Reeve is an expert in survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. His school, On Point Tactical, is one of the most respected in the country. And because he's an expert tracker, law enforcement calls on him to solve cold cases. What type of learnings and practice do I have to look forward to this week? Well, we're going to try and get your awareness up. The main goal is to, is to get you to, to pay attention to the environment, yep. see danger, see opportunities. Uh, we're we're going to learn some basic urban skills, such as lock picking, escaping from unlawful custody. I'll stress the unlawful part. Right, of course. You know, police officers don't find it very funny if you hand them back their handcuffs. <laughs> I'd uh, imagine not. No. <laughs> to tap into my inner escape artist, I'll be following Kevin's lead and learning a broad spectrum of skills. How to escape custody, blend into my environment, lose the tail, kick locks, and finally, jump or boost a getaway car. I'll be tested on all of these skills in my final challenge in four days. Our first topic is how to escape unlawful custody. Mm -hmm. We're going to start off with handcuffs. Okay. The handcuffs that we're going to look at are Smith & Wesson Model 100. A little bit of advice, always have the keys with you when you practice. Yeah. Good advice. So this is the internal workings of a Smith & Wesson handcuff. If you push it, you'll notice it goes this way, but not this way. Yep, As it's like the spikes on a parking garage that won't let you back up. This piece right here is called a pall. This locking bar actually goes up and down. It pivots off this point right here and is pushed down with this spring. Yeah. And you can hear the ratcheting, that's this locking bar going up and down. Uh, if you put a key in and turn it, it rotates this way and lifts the locking bar out of the way. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a pick to do the same thing. Okay. And we're gonna start with a bobby pin. Straighten one of these out, now I like to use the cuff itself to bend the tool, put it into the keyhole here, yeah. and I put a little bend in it. Oh, that's perfect. So it's very simple. All right, so you're going in that notch then, mm -hmm. applying pressure and then going. Oh, applying pressure this way, go all the way back over. Oh. So push it down like oh, that. Yeah. Now rock towards the wrist, and it should just pop. You did it. That's pretty cool. What I'm doing essentially is I'm putting the bend in the bar right there. Uh -huh. Putting it under tension and then just rocking. The bobby pin requires access to the keyhole and fine control you might not have in a real world scenario. So Kevin shows me a second option using a barrette. Using the barrette like a shim, you slide it into the handcuff and underneath the locking bar. This forces the ratchet to temporarily tighten 
But once the barrette is past the teeth, it quickly unlocks the handle. It's like credit carding a door. Yeah, yeah. Once I get that in all the way, I hold this down yeah. and pop that back out. This method requires less dexterity, so I expect it to be more reliable when I'm tested under stress. This is great. It is pretty cool, isn't it? Let me talk about flexi cuffs. So I'm going to take some paracord. In this case, I need about six feet. I'm going to feed it down one of the sides. All right, so I get it in there about equal. Yep. I tie an overhand knot on a bite, it's called. Slip it over my foot. The same thing on this side. Uh, I see. So now I just lean back and bicycle. <laughs> Look at that. That was pretty quick. That's cool. That's pretty pretty typical. Oh, paracord, I love you. Let me count the ways. Number one, you can use it to make a bow drill and start a fire. Number two, you can use it to hang your laundry to dry. Number three, you can use it as a friction device to cut through almost anything. It's awesome. Lean back and put. That's fast. Isn't that amazing? That's really cool. On my first day with Kevin, I learned how to break out of restraints. But I'll never actually be able to use those skills unless I train realistically. Kevin refers often to stress inoculation, which means practicing technique under stress. Being handcuffed and curled up in a dark trunk, I think, is more of a psychological challenge. I can see some people having a very strong negative emotional response to that. Your reaction time, your cognitive function, all changes when your heartbeat goes up, say, 80, 100 beats per minute, and adrenaline is flooding your system. And there was a greater risk of losing my tool, but panicking doesn't help you, so I did a, a breathing exercise. You have to practice in the bio chemical state that you're likely to encounter when you need it. And the only way you do that is by getting comfortable with discomfort. Outstanding. Thank you. You are, you're taking to this like a fish to water. Once I'm feeling good about my ability to escape under pressure, it's time to answer a different question. How do you lose someone who's pursuing you? Kevin says it's vital to blend into what he calls the baseline. So every neighborhood has a unique baseline, which means the people in it move at a certain speed. As you move through an area, you need to look at the baseline right. and learn how to match it. If you can learn to match the baseline, you become invisible. Our minds remember things because there's something about the person that's unusual. The whole idea of a, of a disguise is to make you blend. First category is the homeless people. Yep. And the second disguise is what we call an anonymous authority figure. So a guy with a mall security uniform, big badge on it, we don't notice them. Yeah. The third type is what we call the gray man, the best disguise of all. This is the guy who doesn't leave any stimulus. So they're five foot nine to five foot 11. Yeah. Check. 165, 185 pounds. Check. Check. So by being extraordinarily yeah. ordinary, you have the best chance of being a gray man. You can really pull it off. Once you've made yourself harder to spot, it's time to do some recon and determine if you're still being followed. Surveillance detection consists of doing a series of activities that don't draw attention to you, but that give you the opportunity to check your back trail. So I would buy a newspaper, and so what happens when I stop? Anybody following me has to stop. So while I'm buying the newspaper, I can just do a quick check on my back trail, kind of memorize who's there. Kevin's strategy for detecting a tail is straightforward. Go about business as usual, but force the person following you to stop three, four, or five times while on your way to a destination. If the same person keeps showing up, it's probably up to no good. The idea of surveillance detection is to remove coincidence. Some people might listen to what Kevin has said about surveillance detection and think that it's paranoid, but I have had the experience of being tailed. Uh, no, not for information gathering, but I was in Cape Town in South Africa, and it's very common to have armed robbery in that particular district. So I don't undervalue 
the situational awareness that Kevin is trying to cultivate. I think it's extremely important. If you've performed surveillance detection and determined that you're still being followed, it's time to move on to counter surveillance. But there's a lot of things you can do to, to counter surveillance. Right. You know, I walk down a uh, flight of stairs, I turn around and walk back up, reversing directions. You go in the front door, out the back door of a restaurant. You see this stuff in the movies all the time, some of it actually works. What Kevin teaches allows you to nullify or minimize threats, and in so doing, you can explore more of your city, your country, the world in general. I've got just one day left to solidify a set of urban survival skills. Today's escape and evasion menu includes two new offerings, breaking and entering. So our next topic is lock picking. I consider this to be one of the most essential urban skills. This is something I fantasized about learning for decades, and there's a science to it. In its construction, a drill bit drills six chambers. Into each of these chambers is placed two pins. And on top of that is a spring. The purpose of the spring is to put pressure down. If you notice, there's a break point between all of the pins. The key is going to push those pins up. So it's going to align the break points with the shear line, and you can rotate the key. In lock picking, you have a set, and the set has, say, seven or eight picks. But there's one, if you do an 80-20 analysis, that really gets the job done 80% of the time, and that is the W pick. It is also known as a camelback. Now we're gonna put the tension wrench in. The tension wrench works in tandem with the pick. The pick mimics the teeth of the key, while the tension wrench mimics a key's turning action. You cycle through three different strokes. I'm going to first use the toothbrush, which is up and down and back and forth. Number two is the rock and roll, which is sort of a, a seesawing motion. And then there's the aptly named porn star, which is just this. You can understand why. So you do a combination of the three, and it usually pops the lock. There we go. Yeah. So there's one thing to take away from it. The most common locks are really easy to defeat. So I uh, came away feeling as though I should immediately replace almost all the locks that I have at home. That's amazing. Okay, so now I can break out of restraints, detect and counter surveillance, and pick locks. So what's left? The getaway vehicle. Okay, so we're at the graveyard of old cars here, the junkyard, and the reason we're here is because we're gonna learn how to defeat the security measures on the car so that you can obtain it for transportation. There's two things you have to do. You have to be able to defeat the outside lock if it's locked, and then I have to defeat the ignition. Right. These are what repo guys use a lot. Uh -huh. And in my practice over the years, I discovered that one key was effective on about 80% of the cars, and that's this particular key. So this is a jiggler. We're gonna go to a couple of cars over here okay. and show you how this works. I always check all the doors, because sometimes they're open. That's easy. So what I'm doing is I'm jiggling up and down. Yeah. I'm twisting and I'm sliding it in and out at the same time. Wow. All right, give it a try. All right, let me think about this. Bingo. <laughs> Much easier than you thought. That is cool. It could take a half a second to a few seconds to defeat the lock, get into the car, and about the same amount of time to start the car and drive off. Got it. It is astonishingly effective. Good job, man. Thanks. Thanks very much. Those are useful, aren't they? They are useful. Using the jiggler is a non-destructive technique of obtaining transportation. Then there are destructive techniques. You can use a center punch, and you want to actually go for the corners where there's less flex. The window just falls in. The other way is using the ceramic casing of a spark plug, which feels way too light to do any damage at all, and you throw it through the window and the entire thing just implodes. Because they feel so light that you wouldn't anticipate they would work better than a lug nut. It's normal to see the whole window go in like that.
Once you're in the vehicle, it's time to start. What if you have no jiggler? Well, since we're already being destructive, you can actually start a car with just a crescent wrench and a screwdriver. Find something heavy to hit it with. First, jam the screwdriver into the ignition, and then using the crescent wrench to break all the pins. And you're, you're creating a permanent fixture that allows you to drive off in the car, but the key can never be used again. All right, good work. We have transportation. Yeah. As Kevin pointed out, you could walk into a junkyard, ask what's going into the compactor. It could make for a fun weekend activity. Take the whole family. Why not? It's day four of my urban escape and evasion training, and time for the final exam. Welcome to the final challenge. You've had a couple of days of training. I hope you're ready now to put it to work. To test my skills, Kevin has put together what amounts to a real-world kidnapping. Without giving away the specifics, he tells me that I'll have to face five different challenges, and it will all end with me getting out of the city. All right, I'm gonna go that direction. Okay. Good luck. Yeah. Thank right. you. This is binary. If I fail at any one of these pieces, I fail the entire challenge. Kevin tells me to wait by the bus stop and get on the next bus. You may want to stop for this. Simulation or not, Kevin's team is extremely realistic. Oh. They use a real stun gun and hit me multiple times. Never been hit by a stun gun before, and it hurts. It sends your adrenaline through the roof, which affects your fine motor controls. Being in the back of a moving vehicle with my hands cuffed behind my back, just getting up to your knees is a challenge. Sometimes people get panicked. They're incapable of escaping. They get all twitchy. They can't get the pick in the right place. It's very common. This is where the stress inoculation training saves me. It's absolutely critical that I'd already practiced this skill under duress. I was very worried about the evasion component of the final challenge because I didn't really have much or any time to practice. I was able to hop across the road as soon as I saw a bus coming to a bus stop. Excuse me, is there any chance I could buy your hat from you for 20 bucks? Yeah. Cool. Boom, I have a makeshift disguise. I did do some counter surveillance just by looking at, say, the rack of girly mags and then casually kind of glancing to the left to make sure no one was actually pursuing me. To combat the vehicle pursuit, I was going the wrong direction down one-way streets. Did some other counter surveillance at cafes, went through a Starbucks and then out to a back alley. And eventually, I make my way back to the warehouse. As I get to the final step, I'm nervous, but I'm also smiling on the inside, because four days ago, I would have written this off as impossibly difficult.
completed the challenge. Did. Well, you completed it in really good time. So I would say that was a, a definite flying pass. Hey, good job, man. Thank you. It's very possible to take what appears to be a complex survival skill and break it down into the essentials, identifying which components give you the biggest bang for the buck. There it goes. It doesn't have to be this kind of spy stuff. It could be music. It could be language. You can find that Archimedes lever that allows you to produce seemingly spectacular results with surprising few hours of practice. And that's fun. Hey guys, Tim Ferriss here. One of the things that kills me about TV is that you have to take all of this amazing footage. In our case, we had five to six days of 12 to 16 hours typically per day, and you have to chop it down to 21 or 22 minutes, which is a 30 minute show with the ads removed. It just makes me want to stab myself in the eyeballs with bicycle spokes. It's so agonizing. The good news is we have all that footage, and so we've taken huge extended scenes, we've taken interviews, we've taken tutorials, everything imaginable that we could get our hands on that we thought was really world class that we wanted to put in. And you can find it at fourhourworkweek.com forward slash TV, all spelled out, F-O-U-R, etc. And we really feel like we could have made the best two hour documentary imaginable on the subject that you just saw, or had five different shows of equal quality, all different with the footage that we captured. So please check it out. There's some amazing stuff. And you can also check out the podcast where I do very long, in some cases, two to three hour interviews with a lot of the experts in this show. And that's the Tim Ferriss Show, which was nominated one of the best of iTunes, which I'm very, very happy about. And uh, you can check out both. So find everything at fourhourworkweek.com forward slash TV. And if you think that's an oxymoron, by the way, you're right. If you want a four hour work week, do not work in television. Thank you for watching.